Welcome to the Homeschool Together podcast. Where one working mom and a stay-at-home dad help you navigate the nuts and bolts of the growing and dynamic world of homeschooling. With a focus on early learners. Like me! All the ins and outs of building and maintaining your homeschool life. Homeschool! Find out tips and tricks to make things like this easier. I'm reading! And ultimately, enjoy educating your kids. And what's that last thing? Have fun together! Did I do good, Daddy? (laughs) Yeah, you did, sweetie. Good job. Hello and welcome to Homeschool Together. Thanks so much for joining us. If you have a chance, head down and leave us that tasty, tasty, sweet review. We just got another one in and we appreciate it. And if you have a chance, check out the Gumroad store, maybe bookmark it in your browser. Something's coming out on Thursday. Keep an eye out for that. Also, if you head down onto YouTube, if you could, head on over there and subscribe to our YouTube channel. See our pretty faces, our slim, our rapidly slimming faces. My goodness. <laughs> what is going on? We'll have to cover that a little bit later if we hit our goals, Miss Ariel inspire some some homeschooling families on their New Year's resolutions. Today, as this episode drops, we know you just woke up. The kids are screaming. It's a day off. It's Labor Day. You're not supposed to do anything, but you might want to start do, looking at your homeschool space. You got homeschool coming up. School year starts in a week, maybe two weeks, maybe three weeks like us. Maybe it starts the beginning of the year because you don't roll with the school year. Like Maybe it never stopped. Oh my gosh. But <laughs> you right. want to get your homeschool space. Maybe you're starting homeschooling for the first time and you're trying to get geared up. You have that new kid maybe who's starting. Maybe you got an older kid and you got that new five or six-year-old who wants to get started and you're feeling kind of out of sorts and you want to build up a new homeschool space. Today's Labor Day. We're going to do some labor. We're going to build that homeschool space. At least... In the mind. Yep. We talked about <laughs> some great budget ideas yes. last week for, you know, Our decorating your your space. Um, but we thought it would be a good idea for those of you that are new to talk about like the the mechanics of the space. You know, what do you Absolutely. what do you really need in a in a homeschool space? Yeah, so the first thing is, you know, obviously in your house, you're gonna want to choose your space. So how do you go about thinking about that straight up? Yeah, so I th- I think that this is a this is a difficult one. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I say it's difficult because if you're someone who has like a, an extra room, a basement, mm-hmm. or you know uh, we've had some people have like uh, porches or sunrooms. We've had people have different homeschool spaces. If you have another space in your house, you know it's great that you have that, but you have to almost question whether you want to set that up or whether you're better off doing it at something like the dining room table. If you only have your dining room table, then that's what it's going to be. But it's it's interesting. We we have a homeschool. We have a bonus room and it's set up for us, our homeschool space. The, the, tr- the true statement is you want to build a homeschool space. You want to look at your room, but you really want to come to grips with why it will always be the kitchen table. Well, yeah. so <laughs> that's what it will always so, be. Uh, no, I, I don't. I, I don't think necessarily. I, I, joke, I joke. You just because that's kind of the joke. But it what it is though table. is is you have to really look at where will yeah. you do where is really practical. So mm-hmm. just because you have another space in your house, is it really practical that you will homeschool there? So we set up this beautiful homeschool room um, in the bonus room. And we set that up when our daughter was uh, four. We had a six-month-old baby. And we realized very quickly after setting up this beautiful space that because we had a baby who needed to be in the high chair to be kept busy with Cheerios in order for us to homeschool, that we just ended up homeschooling at the dining room table. And then as that baby grew and our older daughter grew, we still ended up staying at the dining room table because that was where we could keep the, the... baby fed and then eventually the baby turned into a toddler that's where we could do play-doh and so it just kind of grew and grew we're at the point now where we have a three-year-old and a six and a half year old almost seven year old and we're just now actually using that homeschool space we set up years ago so that's why i say even if you have another space in your house really really think about do are we really going to use it? Is it practical? Or am I going to put in all of this effort and money, you know, cost to set this up and then, and then it not be what we need. And also realize that just like us, your homeschool space may uh, change where, where your 
best set up to homeschool mm-hmm. might not be the same this year as it is next year or the year after, depending on the age of your kids, the lifestyle of your family, what else you have going on. Um, so there's a, a few different factors but to also, choosing your space. Yeah, but also thinking about the standpoint of like if it's a basement or it's an upstairs room, like getting all the kids together, marshalling them up, getting all your stuff and, you know, going and committing to the room to go do that work. Sometimes that's a hurdle too big. I mean, and, and you, I know people are it laughing depends. like you don't want to walk upstairs to go do homeschooling. It's like, oh, you know, it's like I got up, I got the dogs fed, got all the dishes out, got the kids fed, making up lunches, packing things up, pulling things out of here, cleaning up the kitchen, living room while the kids are eating. And you're doing all this work and also it's like, I just, I just don't want to go upstairs and then, you know, make a huge mess up there. And, you know, it's like you're starting to think about that and you just go, if I could just have a basket right here, this would be great. Yeah. And that's kind of the thing is a lot of times when you're doing the homeschooling is you can tend to discover where you best want to homeschool. Some people want to do it in the living room. You know, for me, I, I don't like to, it's something that's been a big change for me is I don't want to go and sit on the couches all day or sit in the chairs all day. I like to have space that I can walk around while I'm teaching or I want to walk around while they're doing a little bit of a workbook and I just don't want to sit all day long because when I sit, I get bored and when I get bored, I kind of like pull out my phone and want to start poking around on my phone and I don't want to do that while we're doing homeschooling and there's a big draw to that and so like if I'm up walking and I'm moving, I'm doing something, you know, moving from one kid to the next, I don't feel that temptation to kind of like become a doom scroller. Right. And I don't want to do that. And so you may find you don't want to do certain things or you, or you, you want to have a certain, you know, experience or whatever, or maybe you need to have a place where you can lock away your phone. That's been a big thing that I've been reading about people just having a little box. They just put the phone in and it's like on the other side of the house that that distance allows you to detach. And so, you know, going up to the upstairs room might be a, a big ask at, you know, 830 in the morning. When it could just be done right here. Or it might just be the lighting, Or the lighting might be different. Like, oh, I get a lot more natural lighting in the morning here in the spring. And I just just want that sunshine. I don't want to go into the basement where it's dark and cold or something like that. But maybe, you know, you're having your kids in your dining room where there are other distractions. The TV is close by and there's other things in that area. Maybe they can't. (laughs) Yeah, snacks. Maybe they can't focus. Maybe you need another room so that you can go in there and say, hey, when we're here, we're here to work and we're going to do. And you 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 have you're set up there. You've got desks for them all. I mean, I think it's going to change. And this is the first year where we are actually using our homeschool room much more than we were before, because it is a space that we can all be in now with a a younger child who's now doing a preschool curriculum and has something to work on and isn't quite so wild and crazy. It actually is starting to work out for us. But really think about your family, your style, your, the age of your kids, but the setup of your also house. How many hours are you what logging works? in that one space? Like, for example, we do a lot of our home. We've been doing a lot of our homeschooling at the kitchen table. It's like you do breakfast and you go right from breakfast right into morning basket, early homeschooling. Then you do the homeschooling and you're going between. You're doing activities. You're doing science experiments. You're doing that all at the kitchen table. Then you finally get up and go do something. You come back for you know lunch. Then you do some more homeschooling afterwards. And you're like, my gosh, I spent four hours at this kitchen table. And then you have dinner later that night. Maybe you play a game there. You just end up spending so much time in one place. You kind of want it to break. You know, you need a break. What's well, true. And maybe you end up doing your homeschooling in multiple spaces, right? Yeah. Maybe you end up doing morning basket while the kids are having breakfast at the kitchen table before you go into your homeschool space and do some other formal learning. Um, so, you know, we're not we're not going to be able to tell you where's best for your there's family. There's all these considerations on. Like, there's lots where. of considerations, and some people also. So some people have dedicated rooms. Uh, some people have, you know, do it at the dining room table. Some people don't have any dedicated space, even the dining room. You know, we have a we have like a a couple of bins, a couple of crates in our near our dining room that we can, table that we can use. Um, but some people don't even have that. They've just everything is is rolling cart based, and they can take it into whatever room they want. So that might be a method that works for you too. Like, hey, we're not going to have any specific space. But today we're going to talk about. You know, what are you going to do if you're going to create a space? And I think that uh, not all of this, but most of this is going to be applicable to a dedicated homeschool space or, you know, it doesn't have to be 100% dedicated. It could be a a den or something like that. Ours is a half guest room, half bonus room, uh, bonus room, you know, homeschool space. And um, 
half playroom. So it's like, it's not ded- completely dedicated, but if you're doing this at your dining room table, a lot of things we're talking about aren't really applicable. You don't need extra furniture. You're probably not going to put educational posters on the walls and things because it's your dining room. Um, you may have to do, you are still going to have to think about some things about storage and about art display and mm-hmm. projects and just some stuff, but just kind of take it with a grain of salt. We're trying to give kind of the most comprehensive view of setting up a homeschool space. And in that case, it would be uh, a full space. So Absolutely. just know that kind of going in. So they've gone out, they've identified the space, whatever it might be, mm-hmm. or whatever method they want to start to design that space. You know, when you're you're picking these things, you're picking these goals for this space, what are they thinking about? Yeah, so I think you have to really determine if this is a dedicated space or is this multi-use. So like I said, ours is ours is multi-use. We have uh we have a, a little kitchen in there. Or we we recently did. We just we just got rid of the little kitchen, but we had we had a whole like play, play play corner. We had homeschool stuff, and we have a Murphy bed that folds down, and it is a uh, a guest room when we need guests to come and stay. So we have guests stay. Um, so really think about you know is this just a dedicated? Or are you you know you use this for other things? But because yeah, when those people do come, if it tends to be often like grandma comes over all the time, she needs to stay, or whatever. Or you you tend to have a lot of people in your house you know, over the course of the year, do you want to constantly keep moving your, your, your homeschool space? Do you want to move your table right. all the time? Like you got to think about that um, and how that impacts your, your education and your schooling. How, how often is that room being used for other purposes? Right. When we realized we had this kind of dual purpose and then we were thinking about, we have not yet purchased, but we're going to purchase a big table for the center of the room. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were like, oh man, but then we got to pull down the Murphy bed and we realized that people only come and stay with us three times a year. And we could probably move a table three times a year and be okay with that, especially <laughs> yeah, if it's a light Ikea table, we'll be okay. But it also, because it's going to be kind of in the room and there, it's going to be obvious that we had to move this for those people to be here. They ain't gonna stay very long. He's talking specifically about my parents. What he doesn't really wants them to get the sense that they are intruding. This is down outright truth. <laughs> <laughs> we digress. We digress. The other thing about your space it, to consider with the goals of your space is how do you want your space to make you and your students feel? Does that space need to be? very calm, right? Maybe you have really easily distracted learners. Maybe you yourself are easily distracted. You need the space to be super calm, very quiet. The, The decor that you put on the walls, the design needs to be uncluttered and minimalist because you need this to be a very calm space. Maybe you need the space to be, maybe you've got a couple of uh, children who are coming back from school where they're, you know, they've come home now, they're homeschooling and school was very stressful for them. Maybe Mm -hmm. you need your space to be completely cozy, soft, warm light, beanbag chairs, blankets, you know, think that hygge, uh, you know, kind of method of just everything is, is uh, cozy and inviting. Maybe your kids are like easily bored and you need the room to be exciting. Maybe mm-hmm. you need posters on the walls of dinosaurs and, you know, historical figures and animals because your kids like just, they really need this exciting. They need to go into this and feel like you're walking into a, a classroom that's, you know, yeah. oh my gosh, there's all kinds of cool stuff on the walls. And, you know, maybe there's even things I've seen people, you know, hanging stuff from the ceiling yeah. to make it just, you know, constellation or, uh, you know, planet models and stuff like that from the ceiling. Like, think about what you need, what your learners need, um, and not just your learners, but yourself so mm-hmm. that you can feel comfortable because at the end of the day, this space is not for Pinterest. No. This is for you. <laughs> it, might, it might look Pinterest on the first day, but it ain't going to stay that it, way. It might not even look Pinterest on the first day. I feel like we all, I feel also, like we start setting up homeschool spaces yeah. to like look like this vision that we have of this soft, white, you know, natural light homeschool spaces that we see mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. YouTube and pictures on Facebook and Pinterest. And like nobody's homeschool space that I've ever seen looks like that. Yeah. Um, it, you know, everybody's got some form of clutter or, you know, mismatched furniture or whatever. That's okay. Right. It's for you. It doesn't have to be in the yeah. cover of a it magazine. It doesn't have to be super expensive. And I think what you're, you're alluding to is you can piecemeal this and it could be a very Absolutely. eclectic thing. You can find these things at garage sales, consignment sales, things of that nature, um, you know, goodwill or whatever thrift, you don't have to spend a ton of money to build out your space. It can be, it can have a lot of character in that respect. Um, and I don't want to overlook the the comment you had on comfort of the educator. 
I can't tell you how important it is to not have a crappy chair that you're sitting in. You know, have something that's comfortable to you. Even if you got to get good cushioning, um, get something that is comfortable to you because you you could, you know, if you have multiple children, um, you're going to be committing two hours a day. You, you want something that is comfortable to sit in. That's something inviting. Also, think about yourself in, in the general sense. You know, you can do your stretching or your yoga while your kid is doing a workbook right in front of you on the floor, right? You don't have to be just relegated to sitting in the couch or sitting in the chair. You can have your own things in there that help, you know, and, you know, enrich your own experience in the room. Because the last thing you want to do is have that, that negativity going into the room going, oh yeah. my gosh, my back always hurts after I sit here. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you don't have to sit there. You don't have to do that to yourself, you know, have something that's comfortable. We have the nice couch. Now, um, we have kind of a reading nook. We have kind of padded chairs, something that, that I can kind of straddle and let my legs hang. So I don't, I'm not in that classic sitting position for two hours. I can kind of almost feel like I'm standing in some respects. I have these soft cushions that I can kneel on and I'm tall enough that I can kneel and do work in some respects, standing with my daughter right next to me. So don't overlook your own comfort in this because yeah. it's not just for the kids. It's also for you as the educator. And you definitely want to make sure that you're feeling comfortable and you're feeling welcomed in the space as well. Right. So you've got your, your goals for the space. Is it dedicated is it, or is it multi-use? Does it, what does the tone of the space need to be that calm, exciting, yeah. minimalist, right? The things we talked about, then there's the utility of the space. What does this space have to accomplish for you? Do you need space for each kid to have their own individual desk working, yeah. you know, whatever working surface that they each have their own individual space? Do you need the big table where everyone can collaborate? Do you need a desk for yourself that you can sit at while your kids are working and you can work on lesson plans and, you know, whatever it Planning is that you need to do? Whatever, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, or do preparing you preparing for the next lesson or whatever it is? Yeah. yeah. Like, or do you need, do you need, uh, somewhere where you can lecture, right? We have a, we have a giant whiteboard in our room because we just felt like we didn't know how often you were really going to lecture, but that was a utility that we wanted in the space. If you wanted to draw something out, if you wanted to illustrate what was going on, you could stand up and do it because that board was there. Yeah. Uh, we wanted media in our room so that you didn't have to leave the room to go downstairs to the TV to watch a YouTube video about a science topic. You could just cast it onto the TV that was there. So well, really think about the, the utility. We have the Google Home as well if you want to add a little bit of you know music ambiance if you're doing kind of a music study or mm-hmm. if you need a little bit of kind of a relaxing music while, you, while your learner is working on a notebook. Think about those type of things as well. Yeah, so, so really think about like how, what do you need this space to be more than just, more than just the decor? Yeah. Functionally, what does it have to be? Hey, I need, in our case, for example, we need a collaborative space where you can sit with our daughter. Yep. We need a reading, a comfortable reading spot for her to go and read her individual readers. Uh, we need a place that you guys can all sit comfortably and watch uh, videos on screen together without having to leave the room and break out of that kind of homeschool block. You can yeah. stay in there. We need uh, a large floor space where our, our preschooler can play while you homeschool. Mm-hmm. Wait, there's some big utility things. So really get those down before you start thinking about what furniture you're going to buy and how you're going to fill the room because you know for us for example we don't need an individual desk for ourselves we need a place to collaborate with our learner but we don't necessarily need a desk to work on planning because that's not our our model i plan and and you execute so it's different for us um so even think down to the the granularity of how do you want to work with your student are you a face-to-face learner do you need a table that you guys can both sit on and then you guys are looking at each other yeah yeah are you a side by are they a side-by-side learner where you can kind of sit next to them you know are they a set it and forget it learner do they just need a small table where you just periodically check in on them these are the type of the little things that you probably want to think about with respect to how you're designing this this space yeah exactly you know when you're so we we talked about these goals and Mm -hmm. One of the things is, you know, understanding your goals for you and then for your learners. So this is a good opportunity too, before you put something in the space to really talk to your kids about what it is they think they need. And, you know, you're going to take that with a grain of salt, certainly. 
but it's a good idea to get them get their input so that they're invested in this process too mm-hmm. of creating this space because this is their their classroom too essentially mm-hmm. This is the environment where they're going to be learning and making the breakthroughs and and having all these great moments with you. You need to understand what they think they might need in a space too. So just, just kind of important. And we did talk with our daughter a little bit about, you know, what she wanted in the space when we got started. And she was, and she was supportive of, yeah, she really wanted music in the space. She wanted to be able to turn something on when she was working on, you know, art or whatever that she could listen to music. That was something that was part of her input into the space. So really think about, you know, yourself, your learners and get their input so that they're bought into what you're going to do and transform this into a collaborative environment and productive environment for everyone. And then as an educator, there may be some infrastructure things that you need to support your that room, whether they're like folders or crates or binders or rolling carts and things of that nature. How and you know what do you need and then how will that fit in that room so that it's easy to access? I love having pencils and scissors and glue and, and things like that in little caddies that I can just pull right up in case mm-hmm. there's something like today we were doing a little bit of of reading and I needed to get a pencil. My daughter needed a pencil really fast. And instead of like stopping and going, where do I keep those pencils? And oh, the clamshells over on the other side of the room. You know, for me, I want to be able to within one arm reach, you know, 90% of the things I need. Because if I have to get up, I might lose the focus. I might lose that connection. It'll take another minute or two to get back into it. And we're starting to waste time. But if I can get those things really quick, we can continue the the momentum that we, whatever mm-hmm. momentum we may have already built up. So thinking about how you want to place those things, the crates, the the caddies, the, the curriculum, um, those are important decisions on, on building in the efficiencies around your homeschooling because we don't want to spend a lot of time, you know, wasting time, you know, because we, we can do this faster. It's nicer to do it faster. <laughs> yeah. We put a special shelf in the homeschool yeah. room just for school supplies that is literally right at, above Yeah, literally the at the height where I can sit in the chair and I can just reach it. And it was just perfect. So it was just out of the way that where both kids can't just reach it on their own. But it's perfect for me to get glue, scissors, pencils, pens. Yeah. So when you think about what you need as an educator too, think about, think a little bit ahead, especially when it comes to storage for curriculum and different Mm -hmm. things like that. Because whatever you have now, it's only going to grow. (laughs) Especially if you're waiting for another student to come along and you got to hold curriculum. We're starting to have that kind of accumulation on a shelf and i'm yep. we're already got one one shelf we're starting to work on a second shelf now and we had some art supplies but now we that we have two kids doing yeah. art and the art supplies just seem to be growing and multiplying on their own yeah, like so you, you know make sure that when you're thinking of this space too whether it's file cabinets for storage or mm. shelves or bins or whatever you're going to do Think about expansion (laughs) and how you're going to do that and how you're going to manage that. Because the worst thing would be to put in this perfect system this year and it works great. And then next year, you're totally out of space again. Um, We want to do better than the new freeway model, right? Which is always by the time it gets done, it's, you know, the traffic has grown. We need another lane. So, yeah. So think a little bit ahead, too, when you're thinking about storage and what you might need. I think going on to technology, you know, obviously technology has played a bigger and bigger piece of our in our lives. Do you need a computer? Do you need a desktop computer? Do you need a TV? Do you need some tablets? Some of those, um, that technology needs charging cables and, mm-hmm. and stations. Do you need a caddy for that? Um, do you need a styluses for your tablets? What do you need to, to make that efficient? You know, how do you want to connect your phone to, you know, the TV, you know, do you want to cast it? So do you need a Roku and things of that nature? And we've done a lot of episodes on uh, various technologies in the homeschool space. So definitely mm-hmm. we'll, we'll go ahead and link that playlist on our YouTube channel. Yeah, um, we have a Roku on our TV and it works really well because we can Apple mirror our phones so we can turn a YouTube video on. We could either Chromecast the YouTube video to to the Roku or we can just screen mirror from uh, Chrome, you know, from a browser on an iPad or, or on our phones and, you know, show our kids what we're looking at. So yeah. there's a lot of ways for us to instantly connect without having to leave the room for us. That's a big one. Yeah. If we're there and we're doing it, we want to stay in the space, especially repurposing an old TV. Like we did putting yeah. it up on the wall. It's rare. It's, you know, it's used like once a day, maybe less, 
you know, that is a good way to, to incorporate that into your homeschool. And, you know, for a lot of us, we have these older TVs, but they're all, they're already like 50 inch TVs. So it's like, you're talking about a dream level monitor for your homeschool just sitting yeah. right there. Yeah. Um, a, a monitor would work too. And I know a lot well. of people do that on the wall. Well, especially, you know, like, like we're at a short table. If I had like a 25, 30 inch monitor on the wall right in front of me connected to a desktop and I just had a keyboard and a mouse sitting there. I mean, talk about a great learning tool right, right there. And anytime there's a question we could do, we could do anything on that computer. You know, the monitor would be on all the time. So Think about those types of things, how you want to incorporate technology to aid and improve the quality of the education, how you want to supplement things, how you want to um, enhance things. And I think mm-hmm. about, I always think about technology as not, not the tool to do the teaching, but the tool to enhance the teaching, um, adding videos, adding, you know, art and adding references. You know, if they have a quick question, we can answer it really fast, showing them how to find information because once they get old enough, we want to make sure that they have the tools to go actually into the world and find that information, find it on Google, find it on YouTube. And when they see you doing those type of searching, they start to learn those methods. I know our daughter is very, very focused on how do I use the search terms? I, I wonder if like reading will finally have the breakthrough because then she'll be able to start doing her own search terms on YouTube <laughs> to find LED videos and things of that nature. Um, but how do you want to use the technology some of us don't want any screen time. We don't want any screens, and that's fine. There, you know, no, no, no one's accusing you of anything there, and that's fine. But some of us like to have technology incorporated within within, yeah. within it. So that's a big thing for me. And having the Google Home there has been really big because of all of the music we've been able we yeah. we do we were doing composer we do studies music, with Blossom yeah. and Root. And we're about um, to do it again. We're yeah, we're about to start Blossom and Root early years volume one with our younger daughter. So we'll be doing that again, and that was really fun. It's fun to play music during art time. Mm-hmm. And speaking of art too, another consideration you need to make in your space is where are you going to store and where are you going to display the art? Because let's just talk about it. Let's be real. Art and, and you know craft projects, they are everywhere. So we ended up having a, a wall when you enter our, our homeschool space that it ends up being behind the door later. But if the door's closed, it's visible where we hung up a string with um, with clothespins, yeah. some sparkly clothespins, clothes so pins. that we could hang up the art. And one of the things with our kids is there's only five clips. Um, so when it's full, you have to decide which piece of art has to go away in order to hang your new piece of art. And that's how we kind of cull art and things that are really good I save in a box. That's the reason why grandma gets so much fresh art. We make so much art. Grandma needs it. They don't throw it away. They just put it in the grandma pot. <laughs> right. <laughs> Here so you go, grandma. <laughs> it's something to think about. So you yeah. so you have your space. So you've decided what space you want to use. You've decided what kind of utility you need out of this space. What are the major elements that you need? Uh, if you If you know the size of your space, it could help to draw this out maybe. You could put this on a... Uh, a graph paper. So you, hey, I need desks. I need a big table in the center. Um, I need a space for myself to work. I need bookcase storage. I need a file folder cabinet uh, for curriculum. You know, you you can know the major elements. Kind of lay mm-hmm. out your space. Think about how you want to incorporate technology. Think about how you want to display art and science projects because that's going to be a thing. Stor- storing active curriculums, not just old curriculums right. or up and coming curriculums. How are you handling your current curriculum? Right. And we had a we had an episode uh, not too long ago, link in the show notes, all about organizing curriculum. Uh, one thing you can think about too is we have a crate system where we have all things like current math related in a crate. So she has a math curriculum, but then she also has math games and uh, well, other manipulatives, ma- and you know, like that. things that are, you know, fun math things that she can decide and go, oh yeah, I want to do that. Uh, as my math activity for the day we you know so we have those in rotation a lot of folks i was just looking in a homeschool space last night of a friend and they have a games closet in there where all their educational games live there so that they don't have to leave their homeschool space to pull out an educational game and you know we're game schoolers we love that we love being able to pull out uh, educational games so maybe that's a consideration Mm -hmm. so you're looking at utility storage it's, it could be a lot of things, right? This, it could be complex, especially if you're staring at a blank room and you're like, I don't know what to do with this. And the best thing Where is, do I start? You know, start simple, right? You, exactly. For the most part- Simple with, and cheap. Simple and cheap. For the most part, you need something to sit down at. You need something to sit in. And you need just something to hold your curriculum. Right. The, the, like yeah. the very basics, if you don't have any idea what to do, 
grab a, a table off of, uh, you know, buy nothing or Craigslist for, for dirt, yep. put a few chairs at it, get a bookcase to hold, hold stuff and just start there. Like you'll add what you need. You could literally start with a bookcase yep. <laughs> and a table and grow, yep. you know, make, make posters, acquire things, figure out what you need. Um, don't be intimidated by this. If this is your first time setting up this space and you, you know, if you're, if you've homeschooled for a while and you know, you kind of have an idea what you need, that's great. But if you're totally like, I, I don't know, Start give yourself some place to work and some place to store all your stuff and you'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. So that's the, the idea of design, those considerations talked a little bit about kind of what we do. What are some more you know, important considerations when they are starting to step into it. For me, the big thing is, you know, the homeschool room doesn't have to be, you know, the, the be end and end all. It doesn't have to be the the final thing. You know, I, I, I have found that over the last couple of years, we have constantly moved from different rooms. Sometimes we're in a living room. Lately, we have been heavy in the kitchen room, uh, kitchen table. But now we are starting to move more and more to our bonus room because I need to utilize that more. I like the space a little bit more. I'm going to have a few more open days where I have kind of an all-day availability with homeschooling where I don't have a lot of requirements in the morning. I want to start using that space as as it was designed for and to have a space where there is the idea of education. And we are lucky enough to have that extra room. Some people don't have that luxury, and we understand that, and that's fine. We've heard people using you know, small spaces in their, in their living room, like right around the corner, you know, bookshelf. I know one of the things that we're, we're looking forward to getting rid of is all the crates in our living room and and in our dining room. So it doesn't look like it's, you know, a school room, right? But I think that's an important thing to talk about really. You know, if you have a, if you have a dedicated room, Hey, that's awesome. If you do just have your dining room, again, the basics are someplace to work and someplace to store your stuff. So You'll need a, maybe it's a rolling cart that you can roll out of the way and put away in a closet if you have company. Uh, maybe you've got, you're going to put bookcases right in, in your dining room area and that's where you're going to hold your curriculum. We've seen tons of families do yeah. that. Uh, at the very basics, some place to work, some place to store your stuff. And the the extra added thing is some place to showcase your kids stuff, whether it's their art or their projects. And, you know, even if you don't have a dedicated space, you can find some way to work that in. And I know there's lots of people that love the variety of rolling cart things, especially if you have to, you know, quickly transform that from homeschool space to dining room table to eat dinner. Um, But also if you're on the go, if you're going to your co-op, like we go to our parent partnership. These parents are rolling in with these these carts. Yeah, they have these really cool like uh, they're 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 Wheels and they're like they're like a file plastic like, pop out bins, yep. right? That yep. that hold I'll files. See can, I'll see if I can find one on Amazon and, and I'll link it in. The yeah, channels. and and these these folks have all of their curriculum in it. They roll bungee into the parent cords. Yeah. lots of bungee cords. and then they roll into the parent <laughs> partnership with all their curriculum and they pop it out and they do yep. all this work. And I'm sure when they get home, it has like a spot that they just roll it into. Yeah, they're not guarantee- offloading that onto a bookshelf. Yeah, I, I'm guarantee you, they're not packing that every day and unpacking no. it no that's that's their rolling system right and and maybe and so for them that works they can probably yeah. use their dining room table at home because they're going to be homeschooling at their parent partnership uh, every other time maybe you have a kid who's hyper involved in uh, some so, sort of sport our daughter's looking yeah. to get into swim team it's like four nights a week i'm not sure <laughs> if we're ready but i could see us Hold like on to your butt <laughs> homeschooling <laughs> our younger daughter at swim practice because we'll be we'll there for to. four nights a week we were yeah. we're gonna have to use that time judiciously and work on some preschool stuff i'm, I'm guessing so yeah, yeah. Child care at the y is not open at it, right yeah. so but so you can us. still you can still incorporate some of this stuff even if you don't have a traditional room you know if you've got a dining room or you're on the go you really need some place to store everything i really go with that whole adage you know a place for everything and everything in its place this is one of those times because uh like just this is truth here if you're a new homeschooler homeschooling spills out into your entire house it does it's like, it just it's like the old 50s movie the blob yeah it just goes everywhere and so the the more you can have spaces to store stuff that it can be put away and theoretically your kids could put it away will it happen i mean that's no. up to you get back no. to us but <laughs> um if there's a spot for it your chances are much higher 
Uh, we do something with our kids where we uh, say, are they blank ready? Uh, our kids want to watch a movie. I don't know, is the house movie ready? And then they have to run around and clean things up because we can't watch the movie because, you know, the house isn't clean or, you know, they want dessert. I don't know. Is uh, is the living room ice cream ready yet? And they'll be like, no, and they'll run and they'll clean it. So, you know, try that if you haven't because it works really well. Um, but yeah, trying to have a spot for everything uh, because... Not only is your current stuff going to go everywhere, but you're going to accumulate more and more stuff over the years, and it will also start spreading and disseminating throughout your home. And I think that basically all of us homeschoolers, you walk into our houses and you know, you you know, they didn't know you were homeschooling. They'll know when they walk in. And that's okay. I feel like that's kind of a badge of honor too, that our homes do look a bit cluttered with educational stuff and there are science projects in the fridge and that's okay. That's really okay. Yeah, but going kind of going with that is that yeah, our house is is a homeschool room, but it's not a ki- it's not a kindergarten classroom. It's not the classroom. You don't have to make it that. Yeah, I think this is really important. You see these homeschool spaces, especially the pictures online or on people's YouTube videos. It's crazy, and you see these homeschool spaces, and they do. It looks like you walked into this cute little classroom that yeah. was in somebody's Three, home five person micro school yeah with all these it's beautiful just, i mean they look great i'd love to have that it's it gorgeous nice. right yeah it looks like a private daycare or something it, it looks amazing but your space doesn't have to look like that don't feel like you have to keep up with the joneses there's a really terrific facebook group called real homeschool spaces i encourage you that if you're setting up a new homeschool space or you're worried about how yours looks join this group um it's good for a couple of reasons one it shows you what they really look like not what yeah. people who want to you know promote online show their spaces look like the other thing is that if you have a room that you're not really sure what to do with like you just moved into a new house you've got this basement it's laid out in this funky way or you have this den or whatever it is you know you can take pictures of it and ask mm-hmm. people what should i do with this or what do you, ideas do you have and people are so helpful so i would really join that Um, because it doesn't have to look like a classroom and especially if it's an area of your home that other people are going to see like let's say you do have a den and there's not a door on it and that's going to be your primary homeschool space that's a space that you might want to look like you know educational but maybe also presentable Mm -hmm. (laughs) so you know you may have some different goals in mind maybe your homeschool space has to match with your home's decor a little bit more than a space where we can shut the door and it can it can look as zany as we want it to look. Um, you know, it, the most important thing is that the space works for you. It works for your learners. Everyone is productive and feels good in that space. That's the most important thing. And, you know, if it is your first year, you know, and you guys just listened to our, our budget homeschooling series that we just finished, you know, the, the the homeschool space does not need to break the bank. We've mentioned this already. You, oh, yeah. You, please don't spend a lot of money your no. first year because that would be terrible if you spent a bunch of money on this and then it didn't work out because you yeah. weren't, you know, you, you're new. You didn't know exactly what you needed. We have changed our homeschool space in the last three years, even though we don't use it all that often. Yeah. We've changed it like four times. So well, it's like the crib that we bought for our first kid and we never used it. <laughs> right. Because she just wouldn't sleep in a crib. No. Yeah, we had to co-sleep. And so, yeah, it's like... We And our homeschool space is completely 100% comprised of reused pieces of furniture from yes. other parts of our house. It's like, oh, we had these extra bookcases in the office while we redid the office. Hey, they're going upstairs. Grandma's getting rid of her couch. I'll take that. Yeah. Oh, we need to get a new TV. I guess the old TV goes upstairs. Oh, we don't need this desk anymore. Hey, that could go to the homeschool room. Remember that old folding card table we had? It was kind of nice. It has a wood top. Ah, let's make it the homeschool table. So... <laughs> We completely just repurpose things and you can find some great stuff on your local buy nothing group or Facebook or Goodwill or garage sales. You can get some really cheap stuff to start. And then once you know what you like and you guys are into a groove and you're like, yeah, I want a a really big table for us. We started out with this wooden topped card table that's like, what is it? Four by four? Yeah. If that. Yeah. Yeah, Maybe it's even smaller than that. It's not super big. And now we know okay, we want a giant table (laughs) because what we really want is collaborative space. Yeah, it actually taught me that I like side by side with my daughter as opposed to that kind of 90 degree. I always felt like I was like bearing down on top of her. But side to side works a little bit better because I can kind of sit back a little bit and I kind of disappear from her side of view. Yeah. And so she feels like she's a little bit more autonomous. I, yeah, just even then that little change. Yeah, it's like- From that corner table 
or a corner setup where I kind of sat on the left side, she sat on the right, and we kind of faced each other quasi. She didn't like that. I like the side by side a lot better. So mm-hmm. those are just those little things that we discovered along the you way. You found what worked, and yeah. now we want to get a big table. And that's so, so that like can, nuanced. You know, do that's, that. that's such a you know that's such an in the weeds type of thing, mm-hmm. but. You know, those are those little things that you can find that just aren't working for you. Right. What if you do spend a bunch of money on a big table and find out that your students really need their own private working spaces? Like a desk or whatever. Yeah, and they need their own little desks. And then it's like, oh, man, you know, you've already spent this money. So if you're not sure what to do, you haven't homeschooled before, try to get your stuff on the cheap or repurpose things from your home. And we talked about a lot of stuff in our budget homeschooling episode, but... Really don't break the bank on it your first year because it's it may look super cute, but if it doesn't work for you, then it was a bit of a waste. And the other thing is, the more money you spend on the space, the more hesitant you will be to change it when it's not working for you because yeah. you spent this money. And I, I totally do this. Yeah, you get a little bit of a sunk cost fallacy there. Right, yeah. yeah. And, and so because most of the things in our space, actually all the things in our space are completely reused, we can rearrange them, get rid of them, yeah. move them to other parts of the house, sell them, you know, give them away, whatever. And I don't feel bad about any of it because it was all just reused anyway. Yeah. Um, so as much as possible, try to, you know, use what you have or can get, you know, free or cheap. You know, next thing is if you have multiple kids, you want to think about collaboration. Um, if you want to design your homeschool space, is that something you want to do? Like, this is something that, uh, has become a little bit of a sticking point for me. And, and I've been trying to think about, you know, as I incorporate our three, three and a, you know, three-year-old into the homeschool space right now, she's kind of on the other side of the room playing on the couch with all the toys, and if I need to come over there to help her, she's got this kind of toddler book that she likes to use and scissors and, and markers and glue and stuff. And I can kind of set her up and she can kind of play and, and do some activities. But it's like 10 feet away from me, 12 feet away from me. I have to get up out of the chair, walk across the room, help her, then come back. And, and I may have to stop what I'm doing with my with my six-year-old or almost seven-year-old. And it kind of breaks the flow. And I don't know if I she want if she should be working like next to me or on a table that I can kind of swing around. Like I'm starting to try to figure out how I can do collaboration between my my kids and how mm-hmm. I can move between them efficiently and 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 minimize the impact or you know forcing me to have to get up and stop so that I can come over here and have a problem. Or if she's doing Khan Academy, you know, on on the tablet which she's starting to play around with. You know, is that something that yeah, I have to get up and go help her? Right? right. But if I could just spin around, get her out, you know, she clicked on something wrong and I get her back into it and I can turn back, that saves me, you know, a minute or two of lost time. Mm-hmm. You know, those those minutes add up over time. And so I'm trying to see to kind of play with that efficiency. It kind of goes back to that make make simple choices up front when you start so that, you know, as you get more experience in the homeschool room and you get more experience in what your kids really need and what you need. And, and we know that always evolves. So things are going to be changing. Understand how you can collaborate with them. That's a big thing is, is now starting to manage. I'm starting to get into the crowd management. Right. Activities. And you may determine, we've been talking lately about putting a, a table, actually yeah. another part of the house well, that they might like homeschool. We L-shaped table or the, something. Well, yeah. we were thinking even about doing an elevated, like a bar height table so yeah. that you don't have to sit. So yes. you could actually just stand and help the kids and walk around between the kids. And I would prefer to do that. Yeah. And that would be another great way to go. So, you know, there are, there are lots of options when it comes to that. But think about collaborating and teaching and, you know, what's going to work best for you. And then finally, assessing those supplies, your curriculum, how you're going to access things. How are you going to store them? How are you going to hide them? How are you going to discover things? And store them so that you can easily find them. Yes. Uh, you know, like we've got one of those Michael's photo storage boxes mm-hmm. that we put all of the manipulatives for Right Start Math in. That way we just know that that's the Right Start Math bin no, and everything a, it's goes there. a great there. point because I'll get to a chapter and I'll say, hey, go get the these cards. I'm like, oh man, those are in the big tub and I've got to go all the way to the closet, open it up and it's like, oh, thank gosh, they're right here. I right, just pull it right they're in out, the photo bins. Look and there it is and I get it and I pull it out. Yeah, it's really nice to- Save so much time. And going back to that same idea that I keep bringing up, which is saving time and saving minutes. 
Because man, if you're saving 10, 15 minutes a day, that adds up so much. Well, I fast. think those are f- pure frustration minutes. They That's are. the problem with them. It's not really that in the grand scheme We've of things. We've talked a little bit about that frustration. 10, minutes, 15 yeah. minutes, but I can hear it in your voice. Yeah. It's like, man, I just got sat down. We're just working. And now it's like, ah, yep. oh, darn it. Stop. I've got to go find this thing. And I don't know where it is. So when you think about storage, think about accessibility. We, in our organizing curriculum episode, we talked about like long term storage versus short term. And really think about like, how am I going to get to things and find them quickly and easily? And even better, if your kids know where to find them, to be able to put them away so that you don't have to, you know, manage all the manipulatives all the time would be, you know, bonus points for that. Great. You know, really think about manipulatives, but also like pencils and papers and things like that. Art supplies. Because we have our art caddy that we can pull down when we're doing more art heavy stuff but if you just need some crayons and markers and some scissors to do some quick activity having that right there that you can just pull out again goes back to those frustration minutes you just really want to save those minutes as much as you possibly can um next make sure those kids own that space as well you know yeah let them make it what their own you know if you have an old throwaway table there ain't nothing wrong with putting a few Elsa stickers in the middle of that table or (laughs) letting them write in Sharpie that one time putting their name in the center of the table or, you know, drawing a flower in the middle or, or giving them just giving them space on a shelf for some of their own things. What if, what if it's like, Hey, once we finish, you know, when you're done with your math lesson or whatever it is before your siblings are done, you can go to your shelf and grab your special things that you want to play with or read or whatever Mm -hmm. giving kids someplace where they can put a few of their own things in the room maybe it's a decor item maybe they just help you because they've got an action figure or uh, an art piece of artwork or something that they want to put up in the space because that represents them I think that's great. You know, this doesn't, this isn't as impersonal as like, you know, the kindergarten teacher sets up the classroom and all the kids go and it's just generic. This is your space. Mm -hmm. And what better way to fill it than to fill it with items, you know, from your children so they can feel like this is their, this is their space, their space to learn. I love, I love that idea. Yeah. Maybe your kid likes dinosaurs or maybe like Godzilla or maybe they like, you know, my little pony or whatever it might be. Yeah. Definitely let them decorate. You know, if you've got a caddy that's kind of a file cabinet and it's just bland white and it's not interesting, but that's, you know, Sarah's cart, you know, let her put stickers all over that thing, right? That's her thing. Like maybe they have their own shelf in there. Let them decorate the shelves that to be what it is, but it's going even further on deck, decor, you know, decor and decorations. You don't have to decorate anything right up front. Right. Yeah. Just to get started homeschooling, literally just a table and a bookcase. And if you can't, don't have a bookcase, grab a milk crate for two bucks from Walmart. And there you go. You've got some place to store your curriculum. It doesn't have to be crazy. And you don't have to feel like, oh my gosh, we're starting the school year and I'm I'm starting homeschool now. I need to have my whole space set up. This is something that can mature and evolve, not just over this year, but over many years with what do you want it to look like um, and, you know, adding bits and pieces as you find things on sale or mm-hmm. you finally know what you want, you know, then you can grab things. Don't feel like you have to do it all like right this second. Yeah, because there's that evolution over time and really embrace that because we know with our learners, they're going to be changing over time. They're going to be, you know, the, what they enjoy, what they, how they like to learn. A lot of that is going to change over time, but also how they want that presented to them in the space that they're in. Maybe, you know, your kid might want to go sit in their bedroom and do Khan Academy alone. That gives you a little bit different, you know, a little bit more focused time with another learner. Or maybe they like to, you know, they like to walk around when they're, when they're, you know, reading a book or whatever it might be. Who knows, right? So think about those type of things. Things will evolve and things will change. So don't get wedded to one design constantly get the feedback constantly watch what what is working what is not working ask them what what they like and maybe you can make changes over time to be yeah. a little bit more efficient so hopefully this gave you some good yeah. ideas we we tried to kind of just you know get you thinking about different options yeah. but definitely join that real homeschool spaces uh, yeah. facebook we'll put group in the show notes. yeah we'll put a link down the show notes so that if you know you can get more ideas 
you can just scroll down and you can look at what other people have done. You can ask questions about, you know, what items did they purchase? There's lots of folks there who are hacking Ikea items mm-hmm. and you know, doing other things really affordably. And you can get some really great ideas if you're just not quite sure where to start. Um, Hopefully between what we've talked about today and what you'll see on there, you'll be able to put something together and then, you know, send pictures. I want to see your yeah. cute homeschool spaces yeah. or your not cute homeschool you, you spaces that are a, totally functional. You just start a thread on the Facebook page. Yes, I'll have if, to start one. I'll, people I'll, are comfortable enough, they can share what their I'll take a picture are. of our homeschool space and you can see what it looks like. Yeah. And then and then you all can uh, do be, some show and tell. It'll be, should I clean it before you? No, I won't clean it. You're going to see all the curriculum all over the desk. It's going to be a disaster. Yeah. yeah. Mad, I think, I think mad, you got to be real. It's called Mad Max Homeschooling. <laughs> we are real here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> it's not always going to be clean. In fact, it's almost never clean. Um, but it is functional. It does work for us. And hopefully your space will work for you and your learners. So we finished the budgeting series. We didn't get to do what we normally do at the end of a podcast because that was kind of a special thing. Um, but we do want to get back into what we're into. Um, our daughter... Thanks, Nicholas Flamel book series by Michael Scott is about the coolest thing on the world. Yes. So she's yes. been reading the first book is called The Alchemist. The Alchemist. It's the it's a story, it's kind of a, a modern day fantasy story. Yeah, contemporary fantasy. Yeah. So Nicholas Flamel and his wife, they've been alive for like six hundred years. Immortal Nicholas Flamel. And there's uh, there's a codex and there's uh, elders and there's good elders and bad elders and there's prophecies. There's two young kids, Sophie and there's and Josh, I think is the Yeah, names. and there's uh, there's the twins that are part of the prophecies and and, and it gets into shadow realm. And it it goes crazy. And there's, I think, uh, six books in the series. And our daughter has listened to all of them on audio. So she starts, she, this is one of the first times in our lives so far um, where our, our daughter discovered something that she really, really liked that we hadn't been part of. Yeah. And I don't remember how you found it. So I found it as like an alternate. So we were, we were doing the Harry Potter thing. She's on book three. Um, we're moving slowly through the series, so I think we're going to get into Goblet in, at her birthday. Right. We I didn't want to move to Goblet yet because yeah. of the whole death thing, so <gasps> I wanted to Spoilers. wait. Spoilers. Now everybody uh, knows that now. Anyway, so uh, I was trying to look for book series that are you know alternatives to Harry Potter. So we saw we had the Penny Royal Academy that we tried. Which was all right. Which was okay. Um, and then Didn't there really were, dig it. We did a couple other ones. I did the Dresses one. I don't even know the name of it. Um, there's like the ruins of Gorland or something like that, uh, the, the something apprentice or whatever. Didn't really resonate as much, and then somebody recommended it was one of these you know top ten lists of alternatives to Harry Potter because she kept listening to the audiobooks so many times for Harry Potter yeah. that she was like, Dad, is there anything else that's not Harry Potter? And I'm like, Ooh. not that she didn't love it, not but she, she was like she, wanting more. Yeah, after the fourth or fifth time through the audiobook, I think she was a little done. So I said, oh, I found this Nicholas Fumel. And so I, I, I dialed into our our library um, system uh, through through the Libby app. And I went ahead and was able to get the audiobook of the first book. And people recommended it. And I had, you know, it looks like it was in her, you know, age range-ish type of thing. She's kind of an advanced audiobook reader, but still new new reader. So she likes the audiobooks. And man, did she just like lose her mind over this? She was, and, she, and the story is very complex. She's very done complex. all six, and she made me purchase all of them, so yep. I bought them all used. So and we have them all, them, yeah. and now we're reading them, and we're halfway through the first book. And I have to say, it's quite good. Yeah. We're, I'm really enjoying it too. Um, and she just keeps saying, "Just wait, mom. Just wait. It's getting better. It's getting better." Um, <laughs> well, other than Harry fam- Potter, there's also a lot of famous characters. There are that come in that they're kind of these all these immortal people like. I know William Shakespeare makes a, uh, she goes, Daddy, do you know who the bard is? I'm like, William Shakespeare? She goes, yes, he's in my Nicholas Femel book. Yeah, there's <laughs> you know? there's various famous people yeah, that are in the people. book yeah. that are, I don't know how they're all going to work in, but uh, I, I've never seen her as excited and interested in a book series yeah. since Harry Potter. Yeah. Um, that this is what she asks to read every day. She wants to read another chapter, another chapter of it. Uh, so we highly recommend it. Um, I do believe she's listened to these audiobooks multiple times. Now. Oh, she has. Yeah. She she really loved it. So we'll link the first book here down in the show notes so you can take a look at it. Yep. Um, and if your learners are also Harry Potter type folks, there's not a school for magic in this one, but there is modern day magic. So um, you might want to check it out. The Alchemist by Michael Scott. Thanks so much for joining us today and making us a part of your homeschool journey. 
Please engage with us on social media. Join our Homeschool Together podcast group on Facebook and find us at Homeschool Together podcast on Instagram. We'd love to hear your feedback, questions, and recommendations. Until next time. Happy homeschooling!